We are listening to live testimony in the Stanley Liggins case. He's accused of killing a nine-year-old named Jennifer Lewis. We're going to break this case down. Ashley Wilcott, former judge and attorney, is with us. Not in studio today, Ashley. Uh, you're, you're back home. Uh, you were here I yesterday. Am. And Hank Brennan is an attorney in Boston. He's joining us as well. Hank, good to see you here on Law and Crime. You as well. Thanks for having me. Okay, so we've got murder one, sex abuse one, kidnapping one, arson one, and, and a charge for willful serious injury here. The question is, is the evidence strong enough to get this guy? Ashley, I know you were here listening to a lot of this case yourself. What do you make thus far of the state's evidence? Well, you know, it's all circumstantial, which we knew it would be going into it. I think they're doing a good job laying the foundation, where it happened, how the body was found, that it was burned. But I think it, that they have an uphill battle to really show that he uh, did it. I mean, it is circumstantial. The family knew of him, knew who he was, and it's a small community, but they do have an uphill battle, I think. Hank, I, I know that you're jumping into the debate here about this case, too, but we've got an old case that's being tried for its third time. Witness memories are probably uh, a bit fuzzy because this happened so many years ago, but there's an awful lot of record in this case, two previous trials. Records are really difficult to try a case with. It sanitizes um, the emotion in the case. Jurors watch witnesses when they testify because it's not just the words, it's how a person says things, their memory, the gestures they make. And without that, um, the records themselves, the transcripts really hamper the first-hand accounts. This becomes a tough one. You know, look, we had the first case flipped. We had a, a 1993 case flipped. We had a 1995 case flipped. So, uh, Hank, I'll ask you this. When it comes to trying a case this many times, does it just become rote memorization for people who are up on the stand and, and less emotional? Well, that's always the challenge. A couple of things happen. First, it becomes routine at times, and you have to guard against that. Every case, whether it's the same case or not being retried, you have to look at it like it's a brand new case because it does drain a lot of the adrenaline and emotion out of it. And secondly, when witnesses testify, they seem uh, very concerned about their prior testimony and very tied to it. And there's always the concern or worry that they'll be criticized for being different, that memories change over time or they may not be as exact. So it takes a certain um, natural ability out of a witness. It, it hampers them in a way because they're afraid that they may say something different. So they do become a bit monotone at times. They become very entrenched in their prior testimony, and it limits the government's case. It certainly does. Look, we're going to continue to cover this case gavel to gavel here on the Law and Crime Network. We're going to take a quick break. We will be back in just a moment, though, with more testimony in the Stanley Liggins case out of Iowa, again, accused of killing a nine-year-old girl. We continue to cover live testimony in the Stanley Liggins case out of Iowa. This is the case of a man facing his third trial related to murder and a number of other charges, including sex abuse, kidnapping, and arson, and the death of a nine-year-old girl named Jennifer Lewis. Her body was found near an elementary school. Hank Brennan and Ashley Wilcott are on the line with me here at the Law and Crime Network. And Hank, I want to jump in with this question for you. This case has been tried so many times. We had one trial, and then it was flipped on appeal. Then we had another trial, then it was flipped on appeal. We're back again. They decided to move this trial to a different county, and they cited publicity because of it. Is it the publicity or the fact that there's just simply been three trials now? Any time there's a trial at the state, and I'm concerned that the jurors have heard about the defendant later on, another conviction could appeal. Very safe people moving it to another county so it's not a potential on appeal if there's a conviction. Yeah, uh, Ashley, w what do you make of this? I mean, it, it's certainly a bizarre circumstance whenever a case gets flipped on appeal and then sent back for another trial, but three times now. Right, and I think the, the part of it is it's a small community, Aaron, and so we discussed this yesterday some. That means that people knew about it, knew of it. The same people seem to live in the same community. We have fire department workers who have been to the same fire department with Davenport for 33 years since the time of the incident, 1990. So I think it's really important to keep in mind that the community knows about it, that that piece of the publicity probably does necessitate it being moved so that it, he has a, an opportunity to have a fair trial. 
Yeah, Hank, I'll throw one of the questions at you now as to why this case got flipped. Apparently, it sounds to me like it, it would have been a Brady-type violation where the authorities apparently didn't hand over enough evidence. So certainly, if that's what went on, then this is not a surprise that an appeals court did say, look, new trial here. I think the appeals court made the right decision. It's impossible to have a fair trial when there is police reports and evidence that contradict witnesses. The fact that they found this evidence years later in itself is pretty extraordinary because in many cases it's never found. Um, there can be no real assurance of a fair trial if an attorney doesn't have a right to fully question the witnesses. And so um, while the lower court had problems with that and didn't overturn the case on further appeal, I think the uh, decision to give the defendant a fair trial was the right one. Yeah, this is another one of those appeals decisions that I want to sit down and read personally as we're in the midst of a retrial yet again for Stanley Liggins in Iowa, accused of killing a nine-year-old, Jennifer Lewis. Her body was found burned near an elementary school. We will be right back. We are waiting to see if the court is going to take a break or if the court is going to call another witness in the Stanley Liggins case out of Iowa. If you've been listening, you've heard me say this is a case involving the death of a nine-year-old named Jennifer Lewis. The charges here are murder, sex abuse, kidnapping, arson, and willful serious injury. Those are the charges, and I'm just being told that the judge is indeed calling a break right now. Hank Brennan is on the line with me from Boston. He's an attorney there. Ashley Wilcott is on the line as well. She's a former judge and current attorney. We're going to keep breaking this case down. And, folks, I've been looking into the appellate history of this case because we've been saying that this is the third trial. There are a series of appellate cases here. I can't wait to get into them because that's when we get into the d details of exactly what was missing in the first case, exactly what was missing in the second case, and why we're back here for yet another trial. But first, just looking at that witness get off the stand, it's clear that this is a case that happened quite some time ago. This guy, who was a detective, who was probably in the prime of his career back in 1990 when this thing happened, now, you know, needing some assistance getting off the witness stand. And it's just a visible tangible reminder of just how much time has passed. I'm mean, looking at the photos from the scene there. These look like old black and white photos. Back in, in 1990, newspapers were still mostly black and white. So it doesn't sound like it was that long ago, but it was that long ago. Ashley, um, apparently we're all aging. Who would have known? Yeah, right. So I do agree that, you know, it was very hard to hear him. She even had to say, speak into the microphone. I'm sure the jury had a hard time hearing him. Uh, they had to use the prior deposition with his testimony to refresh his memory, to try to elicit some of the testimony that they needed. So those things all go hand in hand with a 28 year old case. It's going to directly affect the witness's credibility in terms of how much weight the jury gives that witness, I think. Yeah, I mean, is it really going to affect the jury's ability to believe what the guy says, though? Or is the jury just going to look and say, this guy is now 28 years older than he was when he first witnessed and observed what he's testifying about? Hank, what do you think? I don't think a jury is going to naturally hold it against the witness that they're much older. But time fades uh, everything, including memories. And a certain character of the evidence is lost over time. The suddenness, the imminence and the ability to expound upon certain questions or perspectives um, that he may have been able to do at earlier trials. So while I don't think he'll be punished because time has faded his memory, juries are forgiving, I think, in that way, uh, it does hamper and weaken the value of the testimony considerably. Well, let's talk about the value of the testimony itself. And Ashley, I'll ask you this one first. This is a case before a lot of modern forensic uh, evidence was even dreamed up. OK, this predates the use of DNA evidence in trials. This predates cell phone evidence, certainly, which are basically the hallmarks of almost every single modern criminal prosecution. So we have a circumstantial case, people saying that this guy was in the area, that he knew the victim's family. A lot of observers have issues with this case. Is it an issue with the case, or is it just an issue with a case from 28 years ago that we're looking at with modern eyes? 
I think that it may be the second of those things for this reason. So in opening, the prosecution even said, hey, look, there is no DNA, perhaps because of the fire. So we can't even, the prosecution didn't say this, but this is my point, you can't even test it now. Often we have DNA samples that can still be tested to give us some results. So that goes directly to the fact it was 28 years ago. Uh, none of that evidence existed to test today, to use some of our modern techniques to determine, hey, is there any additional evidence? The other thing I want to say is that that when this man was arrested for this crime back in 1990, very shortly in the same month that the crime occurred, they made a point of he was out on bond for an instant with another different nine-year-old child. And so I think certainly that caused uh, 28 years ago them to say, hey, this is one more factor that says it's got to be him. Okay, so, you know, we get into this in case after case after case. Is it wrong to bring in this sort of other bad act evidence into this particular proceeding? And it seems that this is open to interpretation. The rule that I, that I was taught is that it has to be a very similar other act or occurrence. You know, same M.O., same type of crime, similar types of victim. But there's a lot of squishiness in the rule there. So, uh, Attorney Brennan... Is this a case of rounding up the usual suspects, or is it just logical to say that if this guy is out on an original crime like that, that maybe he is the suspect we should be looking at? Well, the idea of introducing propensity evidence, which is another way to say a prior bad act, is like a lightning rod in a case, because jurors can have very different perspectives. For example, they might think that if there is a weakness in the evidence, it's filled in by the fact that the person has this predatory history. Or some jurors might say the evidence doesn't convince me beyond a reasonable doubt, but this is the type of person that should go to jail, so I'll forgive some of the weakness in evidence. The idea of propensity evidence is dramatic, and even as a young prosecutor, I was very, very hesitant to use it, even if I thought I could have it admitted. It really takes away the idea in my mind of a fair trial unless there's something so unique about it. And we see that rule stretched, uh, in my opinion, beyond the breaking point in some of the cases we cover here at the Law and Crime Network. This one, though, since the acts are similar, it might be an applicable way to use that rule if we're going to bring evidence like that in. So, look, we're going to continue to listen to some of the previous testimony in this case. We've got transcript testimony from a Diane Pember Pemberton rather, that we're going to play for you now while the court is in the midst of a mid-afternoon break. We are listening to live testimony from what appears to be a DNA analyst in the Stanley Liggins case out of Iowa. The case of a man accused of killing a nine-year-old girl named Jennifer Lewis. He's facing a number of charges, murder, sex abuse, kidnapping, and arson. We have to say goodbye to Hank Brennan. He's an attorney from Boston who joined us this afternoon. Also, we should mention the attorney for Whitey Bulger, the accused mob boss from Boston. Hank, it was good to see you here on Law & Crime. Any final thoughts on the uh, Liggins case before we say goodbye? Well, I'm interested over the next couple of weeks to see if the government has any more direct circumstantial evidence. We've heard a lot of putting a defendant near the scene, trying to tie the accused to an investigation, but it really is a little bit light at this point on actual circumstantial facts, and that's what I think I'll be looking for as I listen. I am as well. So, Hank, good to see you. Ashley, I know you can stick around with us. We have to take a quick break. We will be back with more live testimony in the Liggins case in Iowa when we return here on Law & Crime. I'm Law & Crime's Heather Hansen. I've been defending medical malpractice cases for